Hey there, welcome to Board Game Hot Takes, the podcast where we give our immediate reactions to the hottest board games just minutes after playing them. My name's Tim. And this is Chris. This is Adam. Today we're going to give our hot take review of the game we just finished playing, Golem. But before we do, I do have some poll results to discuss. I posted a poll on Twitter this week. I said, what's your favorite time of day to play board games? And the options I gave were morning, midday, evening, or always. Pretty straightforward poll. Adam, you actually requested this poll. How did you answer it? Why did you have this on the top of your mind? Yeah, I put it out there. Um, we're coming up on June gloom season in Long Beach. That's where the marine layer comes over and has this nice morning blanket over the Long Beach area. And it's kind of cooler and drippy and dewy, and it just feels so calm. And I have memories of mornings of terraforming Mars with this marine layer there. Wake up, the kid is gone at daycare, and it's just me and a partner and some coffee and waking up to a board game with this calm morning atmosphere. Such a nice way to to not do anything else that day, really. Just hang out, play a game, and mellow out and let the brain slowly unwind itself over board games. So I was thinking about that. I think we had a few days of Marine Layer. It was just reminding me of those terraforming Mars days three, four years ago. That's why I was thinking about this. So morning has always been a fun time for me to play board games. I thought that was a really interesting question, Adam, because when I first saw it, I thought, well, you know what? It's, it's such a basic thing. Of course, I always like. But then I stopped and said, well, what do I like when I play games? Because see, for me, I am not a midday person. I like the morning, early morning, and I like nighttime. And midday always seems like such a bummer. But when I thought about how I like to play games... The reality is I actually like playing games best in the middle of the day. I mean, there's nothing better than sitting around, you know, lunchtime, you've had your morning, you got up, you took your walk, you did your exercise, whatever, have some lunch, and then afterwards get back to a game and then just spend the rest of the day. And then you have the option of if you're getting tired, if you're getting, you know, sick of getting your butt beat in the games, you can call it quits at dinner time, or you can just keep going if you're having a good time. And if you're like doing we do like we do at uh, PDX Con or BGHT Con or whatever we're calling it, then you go until about three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, Adam, I uh, I like what you were saying about morning uh, playing in the morning like that. I always feel the same way if I have a cup of coffee in the morning and you know just get up, kind of waking up, setting, you know have a game out there. That's that's always fun to me. But I honestly couldn't pick with the with all of these. Um, I chose always because I always have a, t- a fun time playing. I was thinking of like PDX Con and Tim Con. Every time of day, it's great. You know, in the morning, it's great over some coffee. In the afternoon, it's great. You can pop open that first beer and start to get into the day. And in the evening, it's always fun to me. I know some people who are very specific about the time of day they can play. For example, my wife, anytime she plays in the morning or in the early afternoon, she always says she feels like she's wasting her day. She felt like, I just sat here and didn't do anything productive, right? So the only time she wants to play board games is when it's in her leisure time, when she kind of gives herself like two hours. It's like after dinner until she gets tired about 9 or 9.30. And that's like the only time she ever wants to play board games. We play more sometimes, but that's usually the only time when she's actually happy doing it. Anyway, th- this is how our uh, how people responded on Twitter. 9% said morning. 14% said midday. 42%, the plurality said evening. So most people like to play in the evening, probably because that's when most people have the opportunities, to be honest. And then 35% said always. All games new and old. David Rodriguez said, I can't think of a time that isn't great. I almost said morning because I'm not a morning person, but what a great way to start a day. So it actually makes his mornings better. And then Chris Barrows responded and said, I only put evening because I'm not a morning person. <laughs> so different different perspectives there. Senti at Board Game Soul said, midday you have the most energy to tackle new games, but the evening usually means folks don't have anything planned after that they need to rush off to. So get, get the most time in, I guess. And Board Game Dojo said, got to go with evening. There's something blissful about coming home from work and de-stressing, socializing with the people you care about that makes life worth living. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, man, Monday nights are so much fun for me to look forward to game night. So, I, you know, definitely see that as well. But, yeah, honestly, if I, if I didn't have work in the way, if I didn't have other obligations, it'd be morning through evening for me. You know, Tim, I just got to go back to what your wife said and... It's such a tragedy because nobody on their deathbed ever said, I wish I'd been more productive. But everybody <laughs> says, I wish I'd played more board games. In a lot of your Googleies, you hear people talking about how many more board games they wish they'd played. So, Especially in the morning over coffee. So I get it. Pretty much. It's a metaphor for life. 
I don't want to go get too deep here, Chris. I don't disagree with you. Like, I have a feeling I'm not going to be on my deathbed looking back and saying, like, boy, I wish I'd done more chores or worked longer hours or anything like that. But I also suspect that the moments that are going to stand out to me are not going to be all the hours and hours and hours that I played board games. So I don't, uh, I don't know if that's accurate. In the moment, definitely would prefer to be, be playing board games than any of those other things. But there are probably bigger or more, I don't know, interesting things I could be doing with my life than any of that stuff that I'd be happier with on my deathbed. So No, no, no. You got it wrong. What a sad way to look at the world. It was sad. Who's super sad? Board games are the key that open the doors to your brain to be more productive in the rest of your life. That's how you got to look at it. You're, you're training your brain to find the avenues to be more efficient in life. That's what board games do. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, let's jump into a description of Gollum. In Gollum. One to four players take the role of rabbis who create golems. And if you're like me and only knew of a golem from Lord of the Rings, here's the lowdown. The golem of Prague was a 16th century Frankenstein's monster-esque character created by a rabbi to protect his people. More on that later in the show. As rabbis, you must deploy your students, ensure they control your golems, and take timely actions to improve your income and upgrade the strength of your personal player board, which represents the influence and ability of the savvy rabbi you embody. The game consists of four rounds, with seven phases each round. I'll try to do this quickly to give some context to the upcoming discussion. First is a refresh phase, a cleanup and reset for the upcoming round. Next, the unwieldy golems march forward. Can the students keep up and avoid paying penance and knowledge? Third is the action phase, two marble actions, and a rabbi action. This is where the bulk of the gameplay occurs, and we'll discuss this in detail in a minute. Turn order is then determined by precedence of rabbi placement. Next, depending on marbles selected, players may gain a bonus if those marbles match those on the character card for that round. Sixth, the payout. Collect income. Gain knowledge, clay, coins, and points. Seventh, if the students haven't caught up to the golems during the previous phases, Knowledge, which is one of the resources in the game, must be paid for each city block the student lags behind. Repeat these phases three times, score objectives, and in-game bonuses with menorah multipliers, and the player with the most points wins the game. Gollum was designed by Flaminia Prasini, Virginia Gili, Simone Luciani, and released in 2021 by Cranio Creations. We're going to talk about the gameplay and mechanisms of Golem just for a little bit of flavor. I've had a chance to play this one time, you know, in person, physical production. Otherwise, the rest of us played it tonight on Tabletop Simulator. So this was my second game, Chris and Adam's first game. I got to say, Tabletop Simulator is not a great platform for most games, and it's a pretty terrible platform for a Euro with lots of moving pieces, marbles you got to drop on things, all of that stuff. So not the greatest platform to play it on. But... Let's jump into the gameplay and mechanisms. The first thing I want to talk about is this little marble distribution device, because that is cool. I guess that's kind of going into production, but this is a part of the action selection as well. You have these this distribution of marbles. Most of them are white. There's a couple blue, a couple red, and a black or two. And there's some yellows and whatever. There's a bunch of different colors of marbles, different distributions. You pump them in this synagogue. Synagogue. And the stuff pops out of there and... There's marbles. They go down these four or five different channels. And the way they stack up, that gives you your options for the action selection that round. So that was kind of that was kind of neat. The more marbles that are in a row, the more of that column that you get to do. So it pays to be in front and being the first player, yet best dibs at doing the most stuff that round. So I enjoyed that action selection piece. I thought that was really cool too, Adam. And I know that there's a million different ways that you can do action selection and there's a million different ways. I mean, this could have been done with dice or it could have been done with cards or there's a lot of ways it could have been done. But I thought the marbles actually lended a really nice kind of unique feel to it. Now, I'm not sure if that's really a mechanism piece or that's getting more into, you know, the production of the game. But I actually thought that was really interesting when you have those, the marbles come down and then you're looking at it going, man, there's five marbles in this, so I can do a super powerful action in this column, but it may not be the column I'm most interested in. So do I go with the action that is most attractive to me right now, or do I go to the column that gives me the most powerful action? I thought that actually created for some really interesting decision space. What did you think, Tim? 
Yeah, I like the action selection in this game a lot. And there's a few more things I'll add on to it. You know, the marbles are great. And the fact that it's not only about the column that's got the most in it, but as Adam mentioned, the color of the marbles, because you get different benefits depending on the colors. If you take one of the three colored marbles, you're going to move your students up these tracks every round, which is important. We'll get to that in a bit. Every round, there's two specific marbles that if you meet those two colors, then you're going to get an extra bonus at the end of the round. So that's another part of the decision. And if you take the black marble, then it gets you two movement up a track, but it's not worth those end game, those end round uh, goals. If you take a white marble, it's a wild for the end round goals, but don't move you up any, any tracks. So I found it to be a very interesting decision every time. I would say that the one thing that fell a little short with the marble mechanism, and I've played this game twice, so I've been through eight rounds of the game. When you distribute the marbles... Most of the time, there's maybe one action that's a little bit better. Most of the most of the rounds. Then after the first couple of marbles get taken out of there, they're all pretty equal. Every row is worth like two marbles each. So not as interesting as I think it pretends to be, but still fun decisions. Now, there's this opportunity where you can pass. So if you don't like any of the options available to you, you can pass. And then after everyone else takes their actions, then you can take a marble out of the cathedral or the synagogue and then reset re, uh, the marble. So potentially you could get a strong action that wasn't available before. When I played in person with with a few people last weekend, um, somebody was doing it constantly. Almost every round he did one of those, um, those pass actions and almost always came up shorter than he went in there with because you were moving a marble out of the remaining pool. And so he'd redistribute, hoping he'd get like a powerful action and end up getting one in every row. It makes you think there's an opportunity there, and maybe once in a while you get really lucky, but I think it's less interesting than it makes itself out to be. Maybe because there's a different distribution with player count, at four players it might get slightly more interesting because you have the potential for more marbles in a particular row. But at three players I thought it was fun, but not probably as impactful as it seems like it's going to be. Yeah, that's one mechanism I was going to bring up. We didn't do it at all today, the pass mechanism. I was wondering when that would be a... uh a smart move to stack the probability in your favor. I didn't see it much, much potential for that in our plays today when it would be advantageous. It'd be, I'd be curious to go back and look at that some more and see like what kind of situation that would be a, a smart move. Yeah. Cause Adam, like you said, we didn't do this a single time, did we? Nope. Yeah. I don't think anybody did that. No, but I saw it happen last week a lot, like I said, and, and I never did that. And I ended up winning the game And I think partly it was because I always had more, I had better options available to me. Let's say you're in the last round and you absolutely need to be able to take a strong knowledge upgrade action. And there's just no way to do that with the existing options. Maybe you can do a Hail Mary with it and just do it in the last round and hope you get lucky. I just don't see that it's the odds are in your favor to get it to be out the way you want it to, though. Yeah, I could see that being the case. And, you know, Tim, to your point earlier about the kind of the marbles evening out, you know, I actually found that to be true on the second move. Mm-hmm. Because remember, you're taking three moves. You're moving your rabbi once, and then you're picking two marbles. At the beginning, we actually had a couple of rounds where there was a pretty significant difference. Like, you know, you had a couple of uh, columns that had one or two marbles in them. And then one, I think, had five at one point. But what was interesting about that is once you had that situation come up, everybody kind of gravitated toward the higher marble count. And then by the second time you went around... It had been whittled down exactly. to the point where they were all kind of even. So yeah. it really did make the player order aspect of things pretty significant. In the first round, sometimes it did. You're right. The other thing that's kind of interesting about the action selection, every round you're going to take three actions. Two of them are going to be marble actions. And then one is this... Rabbi. rabbi. Your rabbi. Yeah, your rabbi action. So there's always four random tiles available to pick from in a three-player game. You're going to get one rabbi action per round as well. And the rabbi action is going to give you a choice of these tiles, but also whoever's highest on that set of tiles that are chosen are going to get to go first in the next round. So it adds still, even though I was a little down on the the you know value of the marble selection, it's still interesting. And it adds even more interest that this rabbi action, you might be motivated to take the three marble row in the in the synagogue, but you might be motivated to use your rabbi first so you can get the best benefit there or take the best benefit that's at the top and you're going to get first player in the next round. So I found it fun in any case to make that choice every round and decide what I was going to do. That rabbi action was interesting because it tied to player order of the next round. So a lot of games will have it like if you want to be first next round, you take an action that isn't quite as strong or 
you know, you're doing something where you're putting a token out there and you're going to get first player next round. And it's not necessarily a super good advantage here. It was situationally dependent. There was no, you know, not necessarily a strength advantage to taking the top one or the bottom one. It's just whatever worked best for you. And maybe you wanted to take that top one. So you would be first. So maybe you could get that row of marbles that would be four or five strong. So it was kind of an interesting choice. Did a little bit different here than, than a lot of other games I've seen. Yeah, I thought that was interesting too. And the fact that it was randomized created some really interesting situations because like we had a couple rounds where the first two tiles were actually pretty weak tiles. And so you could get them for whatever minimal benefit they had, but then get the side benefit of being first in the round order, which I think actually seemed almost, you know, <laughs> like that's the way you'd want it to be, right? But then there were other times when you had a really strong action at number one. So you really wanted to grab that tile for a number of reasons. And I thought that, I thought the randomization made it interesting. It introduced a piece of luck to it, obviously, but I didn't think that was too bad. To change topics just a little bit, the the region tracks. There's three region tracks, each of which represents, I guess, a different neighborhood within Prague. You have, within each region, a number of spaces. You have the space where your, your student moves, and you have the space where your golem moves. And both of them have abilities or income associated with them. The movement of those pieces, I thought, was super interesting because you're trying to move your student fast and you're trying to move your golem relatively slow because if your golem gets ahead of your student, then you end up paying knowledge down the road. That ends up being a pretty heavy price to pay. So it really behooves you generally to keep your, your golem behind your student. But at the same time, you want to scoot them ahead so that you get the stronger actions associated with that. And I was really impressed by the tension that created and how difficult it made some of that decision making. Yeah, I thought that was great. And I think that's probably my favorite part of the game. Um, not only the tension between the students and the golems. And it's an interesting thing because you're forced to move your golems a certain number of spaces. And there's a balance between how strong your golems get, which give you some point benefits, and how much you have to move them. And then how hard it seemed to be to move those students. And again, one of those choices was like, which mar color marble are you pulling out? And that might be really important to move a student up to catch up to your golem. And there's a few other places you could do that. But it did create some interesting tension. And what I liked even more about those tracks was that the choice wasn't just about keeping up with the golem, but it was also about what additional actions do you want to take this turn. And I talk about this a lot in games, how I love when uh, maybe there's a car row that dictates what actions you can you can take. And so really what those golem rows are giving you is a whole bunch of different actions you can activate when you take the golem activate action. So it's not like it's the same action every turn. It's like it's between one and I think four different actions that you could take at, at one time. And they can be very different between just getting a couple of resources versus getting a huge discount and an upgrade or getting another another golem so lots of variety in what you can do when you're activating those golems so where they push to can be important and where your students get to can be important not only how they interact with the golems but also the income that they're getting at the end of the round so i think it's a pretty interesting part of this whole this whole puzzle the golems also introduced a kind of feed your worker thing tim that you mentioned while we were playing instead of like zulkin you got to feed all these guys a bunch of corn here, if your golems get too far ahead of your students on the track, at the end of every round, you have to feed them knowledge. So I thought that was interesting, too. It's another resource you have to keep track of. And then you could kind of whittle these golems away. If they got too far ahead and out of control is what the, the theme was, then you could, they're just a clay figure, so no one's getting hurt here. You could, or you could kill them, send them to the graveyard, and... And that would give you a little benefit too. So that was another way to manage having to feed your golems. Yeah, actually several times, I think, Tim, you brought up comparisons to Sulkin. And as I'm talking through this, I'm thinking to myself, oh yeah, there's definitely, there's a lot of the same feels as Sulkin in this, which I had completely forgotten because there's a lot of overlap with the design team. So not surprisingly, but, um, but definitely I thought that was a really interesting dynamic there. And thematically it worked great because... I won't, I'm not going to get deep into the mythology of the golems, but it's the idea of you know creating this thing that's designed to to assist you. But if it starts getting too far ahead of you, it gets out of control, and all of a sudden you're in a bad situation. It's sort of like I compare it to the the genie out of the bottle, where you you get what you wish for, but you get exactly what you wish for, 
And that's not necessarily a good thing. And that's what the golems are doing in this case. So I'm kind of taking a little bit of a detour into production and theme. But I thought this is one area where it actually tied together really nicely. Yeah, and, and I mentioned the, the variable actions that you get by taking those golem actions. But there's one other thing that also gave you some variable actions, and that was building books. And I know you guys didn't do it much in this game, but I, had, I found that really fun too. Because you could add a book to one of the columns above your board and then get the benefits for it. But you could add those up. You could start to build it up. So you're kind of building what those actions are. And that was really cool. But that kind of leads into my last point I want to make about mechanisms. And that is the end game scoring here. Um, now, there's a few ways that the scoring works. But the one thing I think I really like is that this game is all about engine building. I mean, it, it literally, at the end of every round, you are just given a, an upgrade action. But almost every action that you take also gives you an upgrade action. So you're just constantly upgrading parts of your board. And every time you do an upgrade, which gives you an ongoing benefit, it also gives you one of these score multipliers that are represented by a menorah in this game. But you get a menorah that would multiply one of the scoring sections of your board. And I guess the reason I like that is because you want to be building your engine anyway. That's like the fun thing to be doing in an engine builder. And in this one, instead of making the choice between I'm going to build an, uh, an action that, that makes my you know, my, my ongoing game better versus, or I could build something that gives me points. There's a couple of those, but mostly you build an action and you're just going to get better benefits for it. So I, I thought, I thought that was fun. It was just a nice little piece of the, the reward. And this is where the game starts to get a little bit unfocused for me. There's so much to do. And there's, so there's the right side of your player board and you can like throw some gold cubes over here and upgrade this thing over here. And there's the top side of your player board. You can put some books over here and do some, there's the left side of your player board and there's the middle side of your play. There's a, all these different sides of your player board where you're trying to upgrade some stuff or move some stuff up a track. There's just a lot going on and you have these objective cards and that'll kind of guide you in a certain direction, maybe. But it, it is a pretty heavy game and there's a lot going on. So on a first play, a first pass, I don't know, I felt like there was just a lot to do, a lot to keep track of. And it wasn't too focused for me. And I'm not sure, man, the rules, the teach, there's just a lot of going on for this for the payoff, like we mentioned in the in the last, well, we always, it's a recurring theme for us. I got a little lost in the upgrading and the actions and everything going on, just like this <laughs> sentence. It keeps going and going, and I just can't stop. <laughs> well, I got a lot of lost, so for what it's worth, and you know, makes you feel any better. I, I absolutely was there, too. And I think the longer we played, the more I warmed up to this game. But at the beginning, I was going just absolutely crazy that every move I made, I had to ask Tim about a rule. And I had just watched a rules video, a pretty thorough rules video. And I couldn't figure out what did what. And so that was really frustrating at the beginning of the game. By the end of the game, I felt like I kind of had it. And I felt like it was really starting to click into place. But I totally get what you're saying, Adam. It feels like there's a lot of different routes you can go off into. And the closest analog I can think of, and it's a game that I really enjoy, is A Feast for Odin. Simple action selection mechanism that results in a lot of different options. So basically, where are you going to put your guys? That's all you got to decide. But then where you put those guys ends up having a million different second order effects, which is also a little bit similar to Sulkin. Same thing. You either place a guy or you remove a guy. And if you remove a guy or if you place a guy, depending on where you, where you move him off, there's a lot of different options that you're going to have. So it's simple action but multiple complex results from that action. And I thought that was the same thing here. But let me ask you guys this. Did you feel like you were really building an engine throughout this game? I did 100%. And I, I, I have to admit that on my first play, when I was playing in person, it was easier to get into. And I, you know, like th there's probably two things that went into it, right? Like one is that you're playing in person with the physical components and it's just easier to do that than on tabletop simulator. So you just have a better visual of like, okay, here's what my player board's doing. And it's easy for me to see what, oh, my opponent's doing this. And so I can see how theirs is developing in a different way. And that was a lot more, you know, lost on me in this game just because I, I had to really like zoom around the screen to see what you guys were doing. And so I can see on a first play that that made it pretty challenging to kind of understand how it was building. But I absolutely did. If you build a device or whatever it's called, uh, you know, over on the right hand side of the board, your income is getting better. If you add books to the top of your board, the next time you add a book there, you get a whole bunch more actions to it. If you upgrade your golem, that's clear engine building, right? Like the golems, all of a sudden they get more powerful, they get less risky, they give you all kinds of benefits. 
to me, this a hundred percent felt like an engine builder. Um, aside from that, you you know you move up the book track and you can activate more cards at the top. You move the golems across the board and you get better benefits from it. So to me, it, this is a this is like a hundred percent an engine builder. Chris, I felt like I was building an engine, but my instruction booklet was in the wrong language and I had like <laughs> shoddy parts. I had the wrong tools. So the engine I was putting together was just either by luck or accidentally messed up on this left side. Like I put a, a Toyota cylinder inside a VW engine. So eventually I saw, you know, what I was supposed to be doing and the type of engine I was supposed to be building. Did I really see it? I, I knew that I built it wrong in the end. That was for sure. But I felt like there was some engine building components there. Yeah. So I, it wasn't very clear to me what I was supposed to be doing, but I saw that, you know, as the game went on, my production got higher. I was able to do a little more stuff. I was able to move these guys this way. So, yeah, I think the engine building aspects were there. The reason I asked that question is because this is one area where I'm still scratching my head from that game. Because two-thirds of the way through, maybe even three-quarters of the way through this game, I was thinking to myself, I know exactly what I'm going to say when we podcast about this. And that is, I don't know what the hell I'm doing with this engine. I don't feel like I'm building anything. I feel like the economy is way too tight. And I feel like, to carry the metaphor a little bit further, like my engine is like this little lawnmower engine, you know, this sad little, you know, thing puttering along, right? And then three quarters of the way through, all of a sudden, I had a million of everything. It was like I had so many resources, I didn't even know what to do with them. And so I've got this like, you know, V8 Hemi engine going now. And it's like, it's insane. And so... I'm not sure what to make of that. I'm not sure if that's a game flaw or a, a flaw in the way that I played the game. But I, I mean, I kind of want to go back and try it again just to figure out which what the answer is to that. Is there something weird and wonky about the way the engine's built in this game? Or was it just, you know, beginner's, you know, incompetence in this particular situation? All right. Well, I just heard it. Chris said he is going to request. And Tim, don't answer that because I know what your answer is. He is going to request to play the game again. (laughs) Why don't we jump into the theme in production and then we'll get back to our final thoughts and talk about, you know, a little bit more about our experience here. But with theme in production, just one thing I want to mention is that, you know, I didn't know a whole lot about the story or the mythology of the golem. I knew a little bit about it. I'd read this book called The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay uh, several years back, and it's about Jewish comic book writers and them creating a comic book story. And there was a little bit of the golem mythos introduced there. So that was kind of my first intro, and this was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So when I read the, the, you know, kind of the taglines of this story, I was immediately interested in it. And what was kind of fun about it was to see that play out in the theme of the game. Like the, thematically, I thought it was pretty neat how if you let your golems get away, then that's a bad thing, right? So you got to you gotta stop them. You got to get your students out there controlling them. The production just was so adorable to me. And I don't know if it was meant to be adorable. It's probably meant to be like dark and kind of creepy. But you had this big, beefy, weird looking clay man on your player board that you upgraded. And and you had his eye, you know, like his head was the part where you put the marbles for the eyeballs. And you had these big, chunky little uh, meeples to represent the golems. And everything about it just felt charming to me even though it has kind of a dark look to it so i really i really dug that this was you know listen it's set in a you know european city 300 years ago but it actually had a little bit of a unique byline to the theme here that wasn't just building up a city or making money in a city or trading in a city you know it was it was kind of cool so i i liked the theme and i liked the way it was presented here i was totally clueless as to this theme as Gollum, and i I was watching the rules video and there was a lot about synagogues and rabbis and I was like, what's going, is this going to be, are we diving into the Old Testament here? What is this game all about? But but no, it's just an interesting take on a myth that I knew nothing about. I'm proving my ignorance here and it was cool to learn something new about this game, but I was like hesitant at first. It, it wasn't very approachable for me, but I'm glad I approached it because I learned something new. Well, and that's a really interesting point, Adam, because I'm not Jewish. I'm not sure how I would interpret this interpretation of a, you know, a part of my culture, my mythology. I thought it was done respectfully. And I know that we're all concerned, the three of us, about you know being culturally sensitive about things. So I thought that was a really interesting perspective to take when looking at this game. Now, having said all of that, 
just the atmospherics of Gollum, I thought were incredible. I mean, I don't think I've felt this immersed in the feel and the atmosphere of a game in a long time. But interestingly, it was the exact opposite of Tim. I didn't think it was cutesy at all. I thought it was kind of dark and brooding, and you had these sort of dark nighttime streets of Prague in the 16th century. And the cards for the citizens, if you looked at them, a nice little touch in the top right corner, there's a little window behind each of the citizens, and there was a golem moving about the streets of Prague. And just that riveting face on the mm -hmm. box art. I mean, all of that comes together, and I felt like I was in the middle of this. I mean, I, I felt probably a lot like when I felt when we were playing Nemesis at PDXCon. And I felt like I was in the middle of a story. And in this game, even though it was a pretty mechanically dry Euro game, I felt like I was in the middle of a story. And that's a that's a huge win for a Euro game, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the key. Like, I would never compare this to Nemesis from a thematic perspective. But it, it gave you a lot more theme and story than you would have ever expected from a from what is really a dry Euro set in a you know 16th century European city. The box art... Chris, I'm glad you brought that up. Man, you stare at that thing, and it's creepy, right? It's this crackling clay face of a gun with two different colored eyes, and it's kind of falling apart and staring at you, and it's scary. But then I thought it was cutesy, too. I saw these the golems themselves. They reminded me of the little sumo wrestlers from Kabuto Sumo, so that made me chuckle every time I saw those guys. Uh, the, the theme was, was cool. I knew nothing about it. Now, the production... I thought was pretty neat too. You got this synagogue, you drop these marbles in there and they distribute out in this kind of neat way down these little, some marbles rolling down a track. That's fantastic. Tim, go. Well, I just wanted to comment because we didn't get to play the synagogue in real life tonight. And I actually did have a problem with the production there because when we played on Tabletop Simulator, it randomly put the marbles in a thing. It worked great. But it's kind of interesting, this cathedral, or this synagogue, you would think it's like a dice tower where you kind of drop it and it randomizes it for you, but it doesn't really. The marbles go where you drop them. The first time I picked up the marbles and dropped them in the synagogue, I just kind of dropped them and they were all at one end. And so two columns filled up and the rest of it didn't at all. So we had to make a concerted effort the rest of the night to kind of intentionally scatter them through the synagogue as we're dropping it in there. And then, of course, you're not really getting the randomness of a potentially big row it might happen occasionally it felt a little bit manufactured whether you were trying intentionally to create a big role or trying not to and in fact the rule book tells you i think to have the person who just finished an action or something to fill the synagogue which means that the next person who's going to pull from it is going to get the benefit from there so you'd never be helping yourself but you're potentially hurting somebody else and you're not doing it with a random thing so i think that that was a bit of a miss i think if they could have found some way to actually truly create a random randomizer in that in that marble tower it would have worked a lot better and i would have felt better about it but otherwise it felt like i was just intentionally spreading them out and that didn't really add to the excitement at all well easy solution there tim you open up tts while you're playing in real life you click the button <laughs> it distributes them all and then yeah. you just organize them on Great. your on your real life synagogue anyway that's disappointing to hear that but I thought the art was cool. I thought the tracks were cool. Ah, the colors of the map were cool, and kind of how they were gradiated into each other I thought was nice. But then you get into the colors of your little figures and the colors of the marbles and the player color, individual player colors. Oh, and then that started driving my brain absolutely crazy. That's I'm magenta here, but I moved the guy in the, the red track here, and then Tim is... White, okay, the white ones make sense, but Chris was, I forget what color he was, and then moving guys on, I would always want to try to grab, I'd pick the blue marble, I want to grab Chris's blue guys and move his guys up. Nope, that's wrong. So the color mismatch and the marbles and the colors on the tracks of the map were a little bit confusing for me. Yeah, and I wonder how friendly this game would be to a colorblind player. I'm not sure, but it's some, definitely something that I'd be concerned about because it is very reliant on color. So the tracks the characters, everything. Other than the colors, they're very similar. But hey, Tim, in the physical production, what's the synagogue made out of? It's cardboard. It's like, it's like you know, think of the dice tower in... Um, wingspan? Wingspan, right? Okay. It's the same, same type of material. So, oh, it's, so I should say the tray at the bottom, I think, is a little plastic tray. And then, you, and then it's just like a cardboard um, rectangle that goes up on the top where you drop the marbles into. 
Yeah. So Chris, you, you said you weren't sure how friendly this would be to a colorblind player. And I agree with Adam. I don't think it was friendly to a non-colorblind player. Really weird choices. Like the top row was supposed to be red. The middle row was yellow and the bottom row was blue, except the top row for some reason had lots of greens in it. So usually if I was like, okay, I got to move the red guy and I would look at the rows and I wouldn't see red, I'd see green up there. And there's a little indicator at the far left to tell you which color it is. But then as Adam mentioned also, it was challenging. Like one of you, I think Chris played the blue character. So you'd be like, okay, I got to blue my, I got to move my blue golem this time. And then I would move Chris's golem because it's blue, even though it was supposed to be the golem in the blue row. So if you did have to do that, you probably should have done it with completely different colors to mark the rows than of the of the characters or the meeples that you had out there. User experience otherwise was okay, but there was a lot of iconography here. It definitely took a couple rounds to wrap my head around it. I think you guys had the same issue. Yeah, the user interface, it, it was a little tough for me. The the upgraded versus the unup, you had to kind of fish around and look around to see what was upgraded each time. So when it came to the income phase, you're like looking at where's my little hands that are going to give me income. It wasn't in an organized way. You're, you're kind of all over the map during the income round to collect your resources. And that was a little frustrating to me. I didn't let, I'd like to see some sort of consolidated, <laughs> okay, I'm getting this many, this much knowledge, this much gold, and this much clay. Instead, I have to go, okay, two here, two more here, two from this side, two from the map, two from this track. So if there was like a consolidated production track, that's a weird thing that's in like every other Euro game. That would be kind of nice to have here. Yeah, there were hands everywhere. Yeah, I think you just hit on the single biggest weakness of this game, Adam, because it is a pretty heavy, complex game. And there's a lot of stuff that's packed into those individual moves. And then on top of that, you're trying to keep track of where all your income is. And then not to mention these score multipliers, the menorahs. I mean, when you're actually doing your scoring, you're looking for menorahs everywhere. Mm-hmm. You're looking for menorahs on the board. You're looking for menorahs on the player boards. You have these little chits that you take off of the main action board that you move onto your board that have menorahs on them. And you're, I mean, it got incredibly confusing, I thought. You know, I think back to a game like Eclipse where income is so simple. It's like whatever the number that's exposed, the highest number that's exposed, that's your income. There you go. And the score multipliers here are incredibly important because, I mean, it's a score multiplier, which I actually greatly appreciated being a pinball player and score multipliers and pinball are like a a huge thing. So that actually was kind of fun for me. But the fact that they made it very difficult to keep track of what the multiplier was and making sure that you didn't miss something you shouldn't have to try that hard just to make sure that you're not missing some income or multiplier that isn't graphically obvious to you. All right. Well, let's jump in and talk about our final thoughts. And I'm going to ask the question, would you request to play this again? This is a tough one for me, Tim, because at first I was like, oh gosh, here we go. We're going to trade some stuff and do some stuff and go up some tracks and build some little engines with with faulty tools and rusty parts. But... Kind of like Zulk, now I'm invested. I finally, the rules have clicked. It's like a trick, right? Oh, you spent all this time to, to learn all these crazy rules, and now you're aware of this game that it exists, and now you want to do good at it because the first time you did really crappy at it. So, I don't know. I don't want to say I would request to play it again. If it was on Board Game Arena, heck yeah, I'd do this game in a heartbeat. And I think if it was in real life and set up and ready to go, I'd happily sit down and play a game. Am I going to request it? I don't know. I'd hesitate to request this one. So that's where I'm sitting right now. I'm not sure that I could say it better myself. I mean, it it was a difficult... Well, I have really mixed feelings about this game. Because on the one hand, I really loved the theme. I loved the atmospherics. I loved the production. I thought that was wonderful. But at the same time, I thought it also had its weaknesses. There was a little bit of, you know, a little lack of focus in the actions. But at the same time, there was a lot packed into simple actions. So there was a lot to, there's a lot of strategizing that could be done there. There was those issues that I talked about with the engine building that I, I think are probably good, but I'm not 100% sure because I've only played it once. But if you think, you know, back to the context of a mediocre game, Who's going to ask to play it again? When is this going to come back up? I don't think any of us is buying this, if I had to take a wild guess. 
And so when else would I play this game? I'd play it maybe on a night when we're doing a special episode and we play a, a game, a repeat game. And is this the game I'd pick? I, I don't I don't think I would, but maybe. I'm, I'm really not sure. I, I actually would like to play this game again because I thought there was a lot of potential in it. And like so many games we've talked about, you know, there's kind of like a there's like a break point where I'm not sure, but I think it's gonna go this way or I think it's gonna go that way. This is one that I honestly do not even have a sense of whether it would break good or break bad. But I would like to try it again. I just don't know when that's going to come up. So I I guess more than any game we played, I have to say I'm not really sure if I'd ask for it again. So I played this game on Friday night. We were actually going to do a review of Braj today. And I watched a rules video on it and kind of read through the rules. And it looks like an awful game to me. I'm, I think, Adam, you probably would have enjoyed Barrage a lot more than I did. because, Or than I thought I would. Because there's a lot of player interaction there and stuff like that. And I didn't think you'd enjoy this game at all because there's no player interaction. It's a point salad. It's, you know, it's a pretty solitaire game for the most part. Um, and I think that's probably some of the reasons why it wasn't a big hit for you. But in any case, I requested to play it again because I had a lot of fun with it Friday night. I was thinking about it a lot. And on a second play, I'm not sure I'd request to play it again after. I still had fun with it tonight. I think it's got some really fun, interesting action selection mechanisms. The game has got a ton of variability built into it, which I appreciate. The turn order tracker was always a fun decision. And when do I take that versus grabbing a marble? So I liked all that stuff. I liked the tension with the golem tracks. I think the biggest reason why I'm not probably going to ask for it and probably wouldn't pick it up was just because in a second game, there's still a lot that starts to feel a bit repetitive. You know, you still, you're you're building up one of those three areas of your engine. It seems to me, based on the, these first two plays, that you're going to benefit if you focus really heavily on one and maybe two of those pieces. I kind of did that. I focused on the same two pieces I did in my first game. I kind of ignored the artifacts and just focused on the golem development and the book development. And so the game felt like it was kind of playing out the same way. Even though there's a lot of variety in the specific actions you can take, pretty much you can get yourself in those directions if you need to. Um, I didn't do great at it tonight, but you know I still kind of pushed those engines the same way and it, it started to feel a little bit redundant. So I think that's probably my biggest fault with it at this point after a second play is that it doesn't feel like it's going to bring a brand new experience every time. No, a game doesn't have to. Part of the fun of a game is once you move past that discovery of what can I do to how do I do this the best, that can be really fun too. And I think if you were going back to this game and playing it with the same people over and over again, you probably could get that here. Like there's definitely some very tight decisions. I mean, you're only taking 12 actions over the course of the game, 12 turns and um, and you have to optimize on them so I think there's some fun to just try to dig in and find those the interesting thing is Adam you remember we played Praga Kaput Regni which I had originally kind of written off on a first play and then we played it a second time and I was like okay you know what there's some interest here I want to dig into so I played Golem the other night and I immediately moved Praga Kaput Regni back to my trade shelf because I'm like yeah. I enjoyed Golem so much more on a first play than I did Praga and I still yeah. think that's true I think that if for a mid heavyweight non-interactive point salad game i think golem's great i think it has a lot of fun choices to make and some interesting things to go for but i'm not sure that i want a non-interactive heavy point salad game like i don't think that that's a, as much as i like euros i think that there's opportunities to lighten it up a little bit or make it a little bit more interactive and one thing that i kept thinking about the whole time is like yeah there's a little interaction in the choices for action selection but you got these golem tracks. You've got everybody's golems out there. You got all these workers out there. There's so many opportunities. You could have added some interaction here. You could have made it so that people had to pay knowledge to you if your, you know, if their worker was too far ahead of your student or something like that. Or, you know, there could have been blocking where the you would jump over a golem if your work if your golem moved up there. So there'd be a timing thing. Like, do I want to move up before the other person? I mean, it's all set there in the board to make it so that you could add interaction in there and they chose not to do that and i can understand you know some people don't want that in a euro but i think this game would have benefited for a little bit more interaction with the other players um so all that being said i had fun with it i would be happy to play it again i probably won't ask to play it again though but i i, I think it's a i think it's a pretty fun game if you're if you're into like a, a you know kind of heavier non-interactive euro i think it's got some interesting stuff going on and that was going to be kind of my point my next point was going to be win for mid to heavyweight euro when would you request this over something like Sulkin or something like Gaia Project or some of these games that are great and easily accessible via Board Game Arena or even in person? 
it's, it's just not something that I see unless you're really into this theme. Like you said, Tim, really into this non-interactive style of game, which I'm not. When is that going to ever manifest itself onto the onto the table? This one makes me a little bit sad because I was so enamored with the theme of this game. And I felt so engrossed in that. And this is also, if you remember, this was one of my top five games I want to play in the new year when we did our episode at the end of last year in December. And I had really high hopes for it. And it met some of them. I mean, certainly in terms of the theme and the production, it met that. And in terms of the mechanisms, it did a decent job. It just didn't quite get it over the hump. It's funny, Chris, because this actually beat my expectations drastically. You know, when I heard about the game and I looked at it and I was like, I don't, my first glance at it, I was like, that is the driest, like outdated Euro, but it didn't feel that way when I was playing it. And I really enjoyed some of the mechanisms here. Like you said, take Gaia Project, similar weight, a little bit more streamlined, I felt, and more interactive. So you kind of got some things that just push that over the top. You mentioned Zolkin. Well, Zolkin's just a little bit more streamlined and more interactive. I think there's kind of a common theme there where like, if you can make it more fun to be playing this with other people around the table and make it easier to get into, I think those things are just a better fit for us. This is probably why playing a Lacerda game, I've only played one and I didn't love that experience, but I have a feeling that that's probably, even though I don't mind exploring it, I'd be happy to jump into some of these again. Probably not something I'm going to be, you know, searching out all the time. Yeah, we'll wrap up our thoughts on Golem. Let's jump into a Golem-themed cocktail, as well as some things that have been on our table right after this. All right, welcome back. Chris, what are we drinking while we're playing Golem? So one of the things that I loved about the game of Golem, regardless of the gameplay itself, is that it introduced me to a fantastic piece of Jewish folklore that gave us the character of the Golem. There are versions of the story that go back to the earliest days of Judaism, but the most commonly told story is of the 16th century Golem of Prague. Now, like any good legend, the details vary widely based on the version that's being told and the storytellers themselves. But the basic framework's the same. And that's Rabbi Judah Lo Ben Bezalel created the Golem from clay and animated it through rituals and incantations. And he did all this to defend his people from the anti-Semitic violence that was so common back in the day, and I will say tragically, still occurs even today, five centuries later in the United States. But anyway, the point is that this game is a story steeped in culture, and I wanted to find a way to make a respectful nod to Jewish culture while still offering a fun and interesting drink to go along with this game. To get there, I pulled from a fond memory of my own. So as a little boy, my son went to preschool at the Long Beach Jewish Community Center, which is amazing, I should add. And one of our favorite school moments of the week was pick up on Friday afternoons when there was always grape juice and challah bread laid out for anyone who cared to partake. And we always did. And that made me think of that kosher classic, Manischewitz Concord Grape Wine. Now, for anybody who knows this drink, hang, hang with me here. Manischewitz has a bad reputation because it's a little syrupy sweet. And honestly, it's been the punchline of more than a few jokes. So other than its use on the Sabbath and holidays, I don't think it's that popular. But the sweetness that makes it a bit hard on the palate straight up makes it a pretty good stand-in for other liqueurs in a cocktail. And so the Manischewitz cocktail that I have for you tonight is called the Drunken Pharaoh. And it's a tasty treat invented by bartender Jill Schuster, of the Joe Doe Bar and Kitchen in New York City. Here's what you'll need. One and a half ounces of bourbon, two ounces of Manischewitz, which by the way, I think is available in grocery stores pretty much anywhere in the United States. A half an ounce of lemon juice and some club soda. What you're gonna do is shake the bourbon, the mani and the lemon juice with the ice, then strain that mixture into a glass with some fresh ice and top it off with the club soda. You stir it, and then you have a couple of these, and you will definitely get animated, even if you're made of clay. <laughs> like I am. Chris, I really wish I could have tried this drink tonight. I um, wanted to get out to the store and pick up the, the couple ingredients, which I don't have around my house at all, and, and just couldn't make it out tonight. 
But how did it how did it taste for you? Did you enjoy it? It was pretty good. It was in, it was actually refreshing. The, the club soda you add in to especially with the uh, the grape flavor, it makes it. I mean, it's it's not the most complex or sophisticated of cocktails, but it was actually a really pleasant drink. And I love pretty much anything that has bourbon in it. And like I said. It brought me back to some really nice uh, Sabbath moments, picking up some challah bread and Concord grape juice. And that was that was a win in my book. So definitely recommend this one. Give it a try. Yeah, well, this was definitely on the more interesting of the cocktails that you've presented to us. So that's always fun and, and fun to hear some of the links in history to the games we're playing too. So thanks for bringing that around today. So let's talk about some games that have been on our table this week. I have a game that has been on my table this week. This one is called... Tetris, the card game. Originally published in 2011 for one to four players. Designer is in A. Artist is in A because it's just tetrominoes in different colors on a playing card. But here's the story. Sarah and I had to take the old internal combustion engine car to the oil change store. So that's what we did. And we were trying to think of something to do in the meantime. We walked over to the corner kind of nasty coffee store that the high school kids are forced to deal with, and Sarah and I in this case. And lo and behold, on the shelf, they had a few games. They had some chess up there. And then after getting my butt kicked at chess by Sarah in like 10 moves, we moved on to Tetris, the card game. If you pull this up on Board Game Geek, you'll see that it has a red hexagon and a rating of 4.4 inside that red hexagon. But was it that bad? I don't know. We had fun with it. The, oh my gosh, you guys are laughing at me already. Let me say this. It was a perfect game to kill time while waiting for an oil change at a mediocre coffee store. It fit right in with that whole scene. Eventually, we got to playing it super quick, and we were just kind of whizzing through. It was relatively mindless. There's some take that in there. There's some scoring. Does it have anything to do with Tetris? No, not really. On the back of each card is sort of a, a bunch of tetrominoes mixed into a, f- a formation, into a pattern. They call it into a matrix. And on the front of each card is a tetromino. So you have two tetrominoes in your hand. Well, one of these fit onto the draw pile, which has the matrix. Well, one of these fit in there. How many lines is it going to fit? Oh, this tetromino is going to slot into here. It'll eliminate three lines like in Tetris. So I guess there is a little bit to do with Tetris. And you get to score, you get to flip three of your scorecards in your little row in front of you. You had two rows of five cards in front of you. You flip those over. First one to flip over all 10 of those wins the game. Is there much strategy here? No. Is there a tiny bit? Maybe. Is there a lot of luck? Yes, there's a lot of luck. If you discard a card and you say, oh, I couldn't fit it into the matrix here. If your opponent says, well, yes, you can. You just got to put it like this. They can steal that card and get a kind of bonus turn. This game sucks, you guys. But it was a good time killer. (laughs) We had fun playing it. Do you guys have any questions about Tetris, the card game? So are you going out to buy this one, Adam? (laughs) You probably find it at many Goodwill stores for a dollar. And I would still leave it at the Goodwill store. <laughs> you know, you, you brought this one up, Adam, and it made me go on to Board Game Geek and look. And surprisingly, there's about 15 different versions of Tetris board games, believe it or not. And the highest rated one is number 15,000 <laughs> on BGG's all-time list. So that says something, I think. What a shame for such a great video game. What a shame. Uh, isn't it funny that Tetris, which kind of invented the polyomino game... You know, it has like there's so many board games about polyominoes now, and nobody's managed to actually get the OG in here and, and make it work. That's funny. Ask Yui Rosenberg what his highest rated Tetris game is. He'll say <laughs> Feast for Odin, <laughs> top 100. Nice. So I have a couple of games to mention tonight. And the first one is Tinner's Trail, which is designed by Martin Wallace and is published by Alley Cat Games. I played this with some friends and It was entirely acceptable. (laughs) It was a pleasant game. It was not exciting. It felt so familiar in so many ways to other games that I played. But at the same time, it was a perfectly fine, pleasant game. For those who haven't played this before, Tinner's Trail is essentially a map of Cornwall, I believe. It's set in the Uh, the 19th century and it's about mining and production of ore 
And every turn, you have an opportunity to do a number of different things, which include bidding on mines, so there's an auction aspect to it, upgrading mines with things that make them more productive, or actually extracting minerals from those mines. And that's kind of everything that you do, and you do it over the course of a series of rounds. And really, the, the big variable, the thing that makes it challenging, is that each mine is kind of set up so that it's, it's there. you don't know what's in a mine until you flip the tile over, which happens during the bidding process. And then you find out how productive a mine is going to be. But in addition to the ore that it's going to produce, which is either tin or copper, there's also a water factor. And the more water there is in a mine, the more expensive it is to extract the minerals from it. And every time you extract minerals, more water goes into the mine and makes it even more expensive for the next time. And there's also a fluctuation in price of the minerals, and so your the, the copper and the, the tin. And so every round you're kind of trying to shoot for, I want to mine as much of the thing that's getting a good price right now as from the last round. And that's kind of it. There's some interesting choices to make, not super exciting. And honestly, this is one of those, like the theme felt so familiar. I mean, it's kind of like Irish Gage without the route building, Brass Birmingham without all the complexity. It feels like so many of those industri early industrial era, era games that I just, you know, it, it's nothing to get excited about, but it was a perfectly pleasant game. Funny thing is, I'm also looking right now at the cover art, the box art on BGG, and it's got this perfectly happy man walking off, waving goodbye to his family as he walks up. I think he's got like a loaf of bread in his hand, which I guess is his lunch. And he's got his suit on and his pickaxe thrown over his shoulder like, I'm just going to go off to a pleasant day at the mines today with my pickaxe, my suit, and my loaf of bread and going to go live a good life. Not a bad game. Not a bad one, but not the most exciting game either. Have you guys played this before? No, I haven't played it. And Chris, I assume you played the 2021 uh, re-release. No, we played the second printing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't know. It, it never sounded interesting to me. I know this was just uh, re-released or re-kickstarted a couple of years ago. I've liked the Martin Wallace designs that I've played, but this thematically just does nothing for me and um, mechanically just doesn't get me excited. So glad you played it and I don't have to. Yeah, I'm with you, Tim. I uh, I don't know. Brass Birmingham is the Martin Wallace game for me so far. I'm sure there's others out there that I would enjoy very much. But I remember this one when it was on Kickstarter. I took a look at it because Martin Wallace, oh, he's, that seems pretty interesting. But it seemed like a less fun, less economically interesting game than the already great Brass Birmingham. So I kind of avoided this one. Interesting to hear your aggressively mediocre review to steal a phrase from my Canadian internet crush about Tinder's trail here. Yeah. And I would just uh, add that if I was going to pay play a tier two Martin Wallace game, it will be Australia every time. So I don't need to go to Tinder's trail. Yeah. Having played both of those now and not particularly loving Australia, I would definitely pick Australia too. <laughs> okay. At least, pretty un at least it was unique. I mean, there's nothing quite like a little bit of economic game with, Cthulhu thrown in there. I mean, enough said. My other game this week, I played for the first time that foundational modern board game Carcassonne. It was interesting because I, own, I know that this game is one of the basic games that everybody starts with. And I mean, I played Catan for many years and that's probably my first, actually when I think about it, really my first hobby board game, modern hobby board game and I was playing it before I even realized there was such a thing as modern hobby board gaming. And I know that Carcassonne is one of the other pillars of, of this hobby. My overall impression of it was, man, how games have progressed in the last, oh, let's say, what's it, 22 years. Uh, this game came out in 2000. And, oh, I forgot to mention, the designer was Klaus Jürgen Reda. And it's published by Hans im Gluck Games. And... For those who haven't played it before, if there's anybody out there who hasn't, essentially what you're doing is every turn picking one tile, throwing it down the table, and then deciding whether or not you also want to place a meeple on that tile. And different tiles create different tableaus of roads, cities, 
monasteries and each of them had different point values associated with them and some of them take multiple tiles to create entirely and so you're trying to make sure that if you're going to put a meeple on a city for example then you complete the whole city because that's going to get you a lot of points but ultimately this game fell a little flat with me because really what you're doing is every turn you're pulling a tile out of the bag and hoping that you get the one that you need and it is really in a lot of ways, a straight luck game. Certainly on my first play, I didn't play it well. And I imagine that if you knew the game well enough and you kind of understood the spread of the tiles, like how many of this kind of tile versus that kind of tile that are in the bag, you might be able to do some effective strategizing and not put yourself in a situation. Like I was, I had three different places, I think, on the board where I needed one specific tile and I never got them. And that's frustrating. Maybe I wouldn't have done that if I knew the game better. But ultimately, a game that has that much luck involved in it just feels, you know, it doesn't feel like what I'm used to. It doesn't feel that heavy. It doesn't feel that much like a really modern board game. And so it was enjoyable in the way that a game of Uno is enjoyable. And beyond that, it felt like an interesting piece of history and a reasonable thing to do for my own education in board games but not necessarily something I think I'd ask to go back to. No, I, I played this once about 20 years ago and don't remember much about it. So I don't have much to say, but Adam, I was curious, have you ever played Carcassonne? No, I haven't ever played this one. And uh, no. There you go, Chris. There's one person who has not played Carcassonne. Wow. Get out there and do it. Don't buy it, but play it. I have a Euro game that I enjoyed quite a bit. And this is a newer, a newer game. This was published in 2018. This was uh, Crusaders Thy Will Be Done, which uh, the designer was Seth Jaffe, and it was originally published by Tasty Minstrel Games. And the unfortunate thing about that is Tasty Minstrel Games has gone out of business about a year or two years ago. But I did find out that apparently there is uh, an expansion coming out and it's been picked up by another publisher. So if you want to try this game and you haven't had a chance to, you may still have an opportunity in the near future. <clears throat> now, Crusaders Thy Will Be Done has a theme that really doesn't get me excited. In fact, a little bit of a turnoff and that it is about being crusaders and going and conquering different peoples and taking over their lands. But the good news is that the theme doesn't really matter here. Uh, this is a Mancala type of game. I talked about Trajan on the Definitely a Board Game podcast a few weeks back. So if you haven't listened to that, go check it out. I didn't love Trajan. It was probably my least favorite Feld I've played. I always liked the concept of this Mancala mechanism where you have six action spaces in a rondelle, and you pick up all of the uh, you know, kind of tokens in one space, and you drop them around this thing until you finish out your actions. And um, Trajan I mainly didn't like because each of the six actions you can take on there, were they felt like disconnected pieces of a puzzle. Um, they, they didn't really have much interconnection. On Crusaders, on the other hand, it uses almost the same mechanisms. I'm positive that Seth has played Trajan and probably got some inspiration from that. But in this case, every one of these mechanisms, uh, each of the actions you can take around this rondelle are very connected. They're very, uh, you know, tied together. And what you do in, in, you know, one turn and the way you drop these tokens is going to have a big impact on how your next turn is going to go and what you can do with it. Um, pretty simple actions. Basically, you have this hex map that's out on the board. There are spaces where you can put a building, so you can build buildings. And then there are spaces that have tokens that represent the other people that you can defeat. Basically, three types. One of them, if you invade that land and defeat them, you get to build a building at a discount. The other two actually work this way. If you defeat them, you're going to get a number of points equal to the power that you had to spend to defeat them, but then that track moves up. So the more of, of that type of people that gets defeated then it gets more challenging to defeat more of them. If you go out and, and crusade and defeat these other countries, then you're going you're gonna to get points for it. And the other things that you're doing around this map is that, so you can take a build action. So if you're on a space, you can build on it. If you're on a space with a, another country, then you can invade them. If you're, that's the crusade action. If you, you can take a move action, which allows you to move your knights around at different spaces on the board. Muster action, which allows you to basically make your troops stronger. It's a little bit of an engine building thing, gives you some points for doing that. And you can take an influence action where you just get points based on the number of components you have on this rondelle. And the cool thing about it is that when you decide which space you're going to start from on your rondelle and your Moncala, you get 
the the strength of that action is based on the number of tokens in that spot and then you drop one around the rest of the board so it makes for some pretty interesting turns like hey i can take a four influence action just to set myself up for a crusade action which is on the other side of the board and so i got to drop tokens over there to get there and then i can do a two crusade action oh except my opponent just crusaded in that spot and made it too strong for me to go there so now i have to take another action to set myself up so pretty interesting action mechanism, very streamlined. All of the buildings you can build, there are four different types. Every one that you remove off the board gives you some points, but they also give you some ongoing benefit. So it's a pure engine builder. You know, anytime you're building a building out on the board, you're gonna get some ongoing benefit that makes you a little bit stronger. And then based on where you place these buildings, there's a random distribution out on the board that might give you some bonuses of either points or a discount for building on that specific space. Um, this game was fun. It was really streamlined, really, it took probably five minutes to be taught this game, and it plays in about 45 minutes, I would guess, once everybody knows it. We played three players in about that time. There is uh, variable player powers, but they're not drastically different. So at the beginning of the game, each of you is given an, uh, a knight that you start with, and the knight might, uh, like the one I played, it let me upgrade three of my tiles by default. One of the things you can do if you don't want to take one of the actions on the rondelle is you can flip over one of those pieces and it's upgraded and now has two actions available. Um, and then you move the components off of there. So if you don't have a good action, you just want to move some tokens around, you can do that to set up for future actions. It, it, this game was fun. It's very streamlined. Um, it's colorful. I like the presentation, the production on it, and I really enjoyed it. Now, I think it, it comes in just a tad dry for some reason. Um, I'm not sure why that is. You know, it, 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 it does play quickly. The turns are super fast, so it doesn't take long to get to, back to your turn. Um, but something about it felt just a little bit like abstract, maybe. I'm really curious to see what the um, what the expansion does for this game, because I think it could probably benefit from something that added a little bit of variability to the game to cause some fun. Again, I don't, I don't want to make up what that is, but I was thinking like if there was even like an event deck that happened so that every turn there was like some little challenges or bonuses that you're working with, just to give it a little bit of variety to happen throughout the game instead of feeling like a an abstract race to just move around and, and do these things as quick as possible. I think that would have been, you know, that could add some fun to it. But in any case, I had a, I had a good time with it. I'd be happy to play this game again. Um, I'd say, check, you know, check it out if it sounds interesting to you. It is a bit of a race game. It's kind of interesting, depending on player count, there's a starting number of uh, coins in the table, and those are points at the end of the game. So as you move around and do something, like when you crusade, you're going to get points. When you build a building, you're going to get points. And those get deducted from this pool, so the game ends when that pool is empty, and then I think everybody gets one more turn. So it's a bit of a race game, which doesn't always hit great for me either, because you could kind of tell by about two-thirds of the game one person had you know, 10 more coins than anyone else. And there was like basically no way we could catch up at that point. So again, something that maybe could be corrected a little bit in an expansion. Again, I had fun with it and it played quick enough that that's okay if, you know, 10 minutes from the end, you can kind of tell who's going to win. It was a fun game. Playing time's listed at 40 to 60 minutes. You said it played quickly. Was that about, was that accurate, what you say? Yeah. Yeah. I think we finished three players, 45 minutes. Um, nice. You know, maybe that was after the teach, but yeah, it was definitely very accurate. I would say it would not ever take much longer than that. Did you just play the one time or did you go back to back? Just just... one time. Yeah, I just played one time. So Tim, you kind of alluded to this at the beginning when you said that the theme was a bit problematic, but honestly, I looked at this on BGG and I'm kind of shocked that in 2018, so like four years ago, you had someone that was doubling down on a game about religious colonialism. And I think my how we've changed (laughs) in these last few years. And I think I'd have a hard time getting past that. Yeah, I was going to say, Chris, I think that it is in- interesting how much has changed in the last four years. Now, I really got into the hobby five or six years ago at this point, and it was definitely not something that, that I was seeing discussed in the board gaming world five or six years ago. I'm sure it was in circles, and I you know, am always meeting new people and getting exposed to new people, but I think there's been a drastic shift in an understanding of why that's problematic or why it's challenging. A lot of that has had to do probably, luckily, with the growth in reach of the hobby over the last five or six years and that there's more people um, more people that are impacted by the hobby and that want to be a part of it and so that's you know a, a problem but yeah i mean listen i think we're all learning and i don't have anything to say about the intentions of the game i haven't researched it or anything like that uh, i will say that seth jaffe is a follower on twitter and he, re- he chats with us sometimes on there so when he saw i played it he said he'd 
listen in and wanted to hear our thoughts on it. So Seth, I'd be interested if you want to comment at all about the, the theming and how that hits for you these days. We'd love to hear it. So I think that will wrap up this episode of Board Game Hot Takes. Now, I did get a couple of really great reviews this week, so I wanted to call out the listeners that gave them to us. Um, if you like the show, we really appreciate it if you leave a review for us on the platform that you listen to podcasts. I know you can leave ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts, and that's where I always find out about any of them. So, um, But we always appreciate when that happens. We had two reviews that came in this week. The first one I thought was pretty interesting because they actually brought up a couple points in this review that we've talked about in the past. And I think for new listeners, this may not be something that they realize that we you know, think about or, or care about. Uh, but this first one, the title was Reasonable, Calculated, Entertaining Discussions. And I think that they specifically called out reasonable and calculated in here, and, the, and, and you'll see why. This, uh, this listener said, I'll be honest, had it not been for this podcast covering Wonderland's War, a game I was desperately trying to calculate how bad I wanted given all the hype, I probably wouldn't have given this podcast to listen. When I think of hot takes, I think of people trying to do the Stephen A. Smith thing just in my new board game hobby. For non-sports fans, I thought this would be a podcast of irrational takes, eccentric and overly hyperbolic takes just for the sake of saying something controversial. So I'm going to pause there really quickly and just mention, if you're a new listener, about six months ago, we discussed this specifically in that when we picked the name of the podcast, we picked it kind of just off the cuff. We were just throwing this together, wanted to see how it worked, and then we never changed it. And so we actually talked about changing it like six months ago, specifically because I was afraid that people would be turned off or may not give it a try because that's not what they were looking for. That's not really what we do either. Ultimately... We ended up not changing it because it would have been a lot of work and we would have lost the potential for you know name recognition and stuff like that. So, yeah, we don't really give hot takes that often. Now it's kind of a joke, too. We we joke about how uncontroversial and unhot and un-Stephen A. Smith. I know exactly what you're talking about with Stephen A. Smith and Colin Cowherd and all these guys that yell into the microphone to create entertainment and controversy. And probably Tim and Chris don't because they don't care about sports, but I do. And it's just frustrating. I can't stand watching those guys. Just give me some information, some stuff I might be able to use, and it might be boring, but that's what I'm into. Well, and I mean, in reality, I think there's still legitimate use of hot takes here. It just wasn't the one that most people think of. We're not being hot takes in the sense of, man, here's something exciting and controversial. It's hot takes like, we just played this game. What do you think? It's a different kind of hot take. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't even know if that's an accurate usage, but that's how what I was thinking when I named it, and you know that's that's what we've got. So let me continue reading here. So he said, despite my fears, after listening to the Wonderlands War episode, I was immediately drawn into how these hosts break the games down, how they analyze and evaluate them, and even how they interact with each other. I've returned for episode after episode. It helps that we have very similar tastes, as I was very curious to learn more about games like Great Western Trail, El Grande, and Root, and I plan on continuing to come back. The discussions are engaging and about topics I find interesting to talk about in the greater scope of the hobby. I've recommended this to my friends, and if you're considering listening, I recommend it to you. Find an episode with a game you're interested in to start or one you have a strong opinion about and see how your thoughts compare, and I'm sure you'll be back. So this was a really, really nice review, and I appreciate them calling this out. And hopefully some listeners that are browsing through podcasts and see this, maybe that will give them a better sense for what they're coming into. They did have one question at the end, though, that I wanted to answer here. They said, one question, though, is there a way to interact for the non-Twitter users with y'all for responding to questions, etc.? So not today. Um, the reality is, is that I don't want to put a lot of energy into social media. I don't like being on social media. I'm on Twitter frequently just because I care about the podcast and I want to get out to listeners. I want to interact with our listeners. So that's the one platform I've picked and that's where we post polls. So apologize for that. At some point we might spread out a little bit more, make it a little bit easier. If you ever go on Twitter, even if you're not logged in and you just look at our account and you see one of those polls, feel free to drop me a note at Tim at boardgamehottakes.com and, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll read your response on the air. So you, you can interact that way, but I know it's not ideal. Um, we also might do like a board game geek guild at some point, which would be another platform that we could put that on. But for today, if you want to uh, respond to those polls, if you want to interact with us, Twitter really is the best place to find us. And, you know, don't be shy. Even if you don't want to be on Twitter, create an account, just follow us and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll chat with you on there. It'll be fun. Uh, but anyway, thank you so much. That was a really awesome review. This was Brooks 8, and that was on Apple Podcasts in the United States. I have one more review, though, and this was a uh, Canadian listener. Canadians are the nicest. We always get the nicest reviews. Some of our 
biggest fans are Canadians. We love having you guys on board. I know it gets cold up there and you need to find something to do stuck inside all the time. I think board games is a great way to go about it. All right, here's what, uh, here's what they said. Uh, this is MC Shiro, most enjoyable board game podcast. Been listening for a couple months now and I enjoy you guys so much. Great personalities and great games you're reviewing. I also love the special drinks that are themed after each game. So thank you. And Chris, I wanted to make sure that you got that shout out since you put so much effort and energy into that segment of our show, which is always entertaining for me as well. Yeah, this was great. And I can't tell you listeners how much we appreciate these. It's always amazing to me to hear that people enjoy our personalities because to be honest, we don't even enjoy each other that much. So it's it's always fun to hear that. Um, but you are why we keep doing this. If we weren't getting any feedback, if we weren't, if we didn't have people listening to us, we probably would stop. So leave us reviews, lets people know that, um, lets us know that people are listening. And also, as I mentioned, follow us on, on Twitter at BG underscore hot takes if you want to interact with us. Um, we I think overnight tonight we're going to break a thousand followers on Twitter. So that's a big a big uh, benchmark for us and exciting to uh, to be growing and, and having more people following us. Yay. All right. Well, that'll wrap us up this week. Until next week, take care, everybody. Good night, all. Bye-bye.